Good morning. Welcome to the Crossing Baptist Church. Here at the Crossing, our mission is sharing Christ, equipping believers, and serving people. If you'd like more information about the Crossing, or if you have a prayer request, please email us at contact at crossingbaptist.org. Please visit our website and join our Facebook page. Our service is about to start momentarily. So have a blessed day and hope to see you soon. <clears throat> thank you, worship team, and thank you to all who have led us so far in worship today. Thank you for being here. Those of you who are here uh, in person, thank you for joining us online. Those of you who are here uh, worshiping together online. I uh, want to begin this morning by asking how you open things. Uh, what is your method for opening a gift, for example. Um, I remember when our kids were really young, when their first Christmas or so, when you first give a baby a wrapped present, the baby doesn't quite know what to do with that yet. And so you have to illustrate, this is how you open a present. But by the next year, you don't have to illustrate anything. Uh, how does a two-year-old open a present? How does a three-year-old open a present? They rip it open. Uh, some people never... Uh, never change. They, they continue. To, uh, when they get a gift or something they're excited about, when was the last time you got something from Amazon or UPS and you thought, oh, it's finally here. Did you open it very carefully or did you rip it open? Uh, how do you open a door? Uh, most of us, depending on where we are, we, we might open a door very you know, cautiously, make sure nobody's behind it, uh, make sure nobody's coming the other direction. What about in an emergency? Uh, you hear someone screaming uh, on the other side of the house. How do you open that door? Um, how do firefighters open doors <laughs> when they know that there's uh, a fire and someone who is, needs to be rescued inside? With those two images, kind of competing images in your mind, opening a present and opening a door in case of an emergency, I want you to hear again the words of Isaiah 64, verse 1, where the title of our, our message today comes from, and then we'll read the rest of the chapter. Oh, that you would rend the heavens and come down, that the mountains would quake at your presence, as fire kindles the brushwood, as fire causes water to boil, to make your name known to your adversaries, that the nations may tremble at your presence. When you did awesome things which we did not expect, when you came down, the mountains quaked at your presence. For from of old they have not heard nor perceived by ear, Neither has the eye seen a God besides you, who acts in behalf of the one who waits for him. You meet him who rejoices in doing righteousness, who remembers you in your ways. Behold, you were angry, for we sinned. We continued in them a long time. And shall we be saved? For all of us have become like one who is unclean. All our righteous deeds are like a filthy garment, and all of us wither like a leaf. And our iniquities like the wind take us away. And there's no one who calls on your name, who rouses himself to take hold of you. For you have hidden your face from us and have delivered us into the power of our iniquities. But now, O oh Lord, you are our father. We are the clay and you are our potter. And all of us are the work of your hand. Do not be angry beyond measure, O oh Lord. Not, neither remember iniquity forever. Behold, look now. All of us are your people. Your holy cities have become a wilderness. Zion has become a wilderness. Jerusalem, a desolation. Our holy and beautiful house, where our fathers praised you, has been burned by fire. And all our precious things have become a ruin. Will you restrain yourself at these things, O Lord? Will you keep silent and afflict us beyond measure? I hope you can feel the emotion that comes off of this page, this prayer that's part of a prophecy of the book of Isaiah. The book of Isaiah spans a lot of Israel's history. The first part of the book of Isaiah is directed toward a particular time in Israel's history when they were facing the threat of invasion and the threat of destruction, and God delivered them from that invasion, and God delivered them from that destruction. From Isaiah 40 to the end of the book, which ends in chapter 66, it's, it, the prophecy is to a different period of Israel's history. It's to the exiles and those who have recently returned from exile. Uh, Isaiah 64 is a prophecy to those 
a prayer of those who have returned from exile. The prophet is speaking on behalf of his people, praying and prophesying together at the same time. But this is for the exiles that have returned from Babylon, those who are a generation older than the ones who were taken from, from Babylon. They were born and grew up in a, a place that was not Israel. They were born and grew up hearing stories of the temple. They were born and grew up in Babylon hearing stories of Israel. And now, miraculously, God has brought them back. And it's kind of like when people come home after a hurricane uh, and they see everything wrecked. It's their home still, but man, what a mess. <laughs> this place is a mess. And this is the prayer of people that are looking back on their home and seeing that it's a mess. God has done something amazing. God has done something that's never happened before to bring an entire people back from exile. And yet, they still need God's help. They still need for God to come down. They still need for God to show up in power and shake the mountains and make things different than they are. This is a prayer for God. If God has a present to give, this is a prayer, a prayer for God to rip it open. And let's get to it. There's an emergency, and this is a prayer for God to kick the door in and come in. This is a prayer for God to crash into the world like the Kool-Aid man. I don't think uh, the Kool-Aid man, there are still Kool-Aid commercials out there. Okay, is the Kool-Aid man still crashing through the wall? This is a prayer for God to tear open the heavens, not for God to gently open the heavens. Some people open a present so they can reuse the wrapping paper. And those people are a little strange. Uh, because presents are meant to be torn open. Uh, the wrapping paper is meant to be ripped to shreds, and, and this is a prayer for God to rip the sky to shreds. Uh, th this is a prayer for God the firefighter to take his axe and break open the door and show up and save us. Show up and show out. And the prophet praying here knows that God can do it. He knows God can do it because he reviews God's resume in the first several verses. You've done this before in verse 3. You've already done awesome things which we did not expect. In the recent past, in, in uh, the days and months before, they had returned from exile. Uh, that had never happened before. The return from exile made them think back even further to when God had previously done things that no one had ever done before, like freeing an entire people from slavery. When an Israelite talks about the mountains quaking, they're going to be thinking about Mount Sinai. When God showed up and gave his people the law and said, I will be your God and you will be my people, my kingdom of priests. And God shook the mountains, and there was fire in the sky. We've seen you do that before. We remember, our people remember that you have done unexpected things in the past, and we want you to do something unexpected now, something to make the nations tremble. Uh, the prophet knows that God can be counted on to act for the one who waits on him. It's a beautiful verse in verse 4. Of old, no one has seen or heard by ear. No one has seen a God besides you. No other God has done anything like this because there is no other God who acts in behalf of the one who waits for him, who meets him, who rejoices in doing righteousness. The prophet knows this about God. God can be counted on to act for the one who is waiting on God, to act for the righteous. But there's a problem. Verse 5, the prayer turns into a confession. And a question, you were angry because we sinned. We continued in them a long time. You look back at the history of Israel and God, there's this history of God showing up and showing out, this history of God doing unexpected things, but there's also this history of the people continuing in sin for a long time. The very next thing that happens after God shows up on the mountain and gives the law to the people is that the people decide Moses has been gone too long and we need a God that we can count on. We need a God that's a little more predictable. And so they create an idol and start to worship it. The reason they went into exile was because of their injustice and their idolatry. And they had been warned over and over and over. Isaiah is the, 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 the latest in a long line of prophets. Warning. This is what happens uh, when you do not do what God has asked you to do. You, it results in the loss of everything that you love. And then the question, that haunting question, shall we be saved? We are so sinful. Is it possible that we might be saved? Like I said earlier, it's like someone coming back home uh, and finding that their house has been on fire or coming back home and finding a hurricane has destroyed their house. Um, and there's grief here for what's been lost. And the, the prophet recounts that. 
uh, the, the things that have been lost in verse 10 and 11. The, art, the holy cities have become a wilderness. Nobody lives there anymore. Uh, Jerusalem has become a desolation. Our holy and beautiful house, the temple, where our fathers praised you, has been burned by fire. And all our precious things, those things that were most important to us, those things that were in the temple, they become a ruin. So there's grief for what's been lost, but there's this hope that God will res- resolve to repair and restore and rebuild. And that because of God and because of God's graciousness, because they are his people, that he will give them hope for the future. There's that turn there in verse 5. We, we've seen what God has done in the past, but man. And then the next several verses talk about the depth of the people's sin. The famous verse, all our righteous deeds are like a filthy garment. The best we can do is like dirty clothes to God. We wither. We're like one who's unclean. No one calls on you. But then there's another turn in verse 8. But now, O Lord, in spite of everything, in spite of you knowing this about us, you are our Father. That relationship has not changed. Our sinfulness has not changed your relationship to us. We are the clay, and you are the potter, and all of us are the work of your hand. Behind that metaphor is this trust that God is shaping, even in this moment, even in this moment of grief, and even in this moment of maybe hope. The, the, the hope is not uh, spelled out real powerfully here. It's, 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 you know, sort of a dot, 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 question mark, hope. But it hinges on this. You are our Father. We are the clay and you are the potter and all of us are the work of your hand. There's several schools of thought about hope. Um, one school of thought about hope is that you should always hope for the best, that you should expect the best even. What usually happens, though, is that if, if that's your, your mode of operation, to always hope for the best, to always expect the best, when the best doesn't happen, that you then have to sort of spin it. <laughs> you, have to, uh, you have to minimize or ignore the things that happen that are not the best. It would be like coming home, uh, finding that your house is burned down, and saying, well, you know, now we have all this charcoal that we can sell. You have to, you know, you spin things in, a, in a, the most positive way possible. And some people approach hope in that way, that no matter what the bad circumstances are, that there's something that you can hold on to. Some people go the opposite direction, and their mode of operation is lower your expectations so that you won't be disappointed. Expect nothing. Expect the worst. And then if, uh, you know, a fire burns down your house and, uh, but didn't burn your car, then you can be pleasantly surprised. Oh, that's nice. At least we still have a car. You can be pleasantly surprised when things work out. Some people, I think, come by those two positions more or less naturally. Uh, and some people, I think, learn to expect the worst from bitter experience or expect the best because they, whatever, for whatever set of circumstances or reasons in their lives, good things tend to happen to them. So depending on temperament or depending on experience, you come to one or the other of those things. But from this chapter, as I was, as I was, as I was reflecting on that this week, I thought, the biblical way is a little bit different. The biblical way of hope tells us that we have probably all set our hopes too high in some ways, and we have probably all set our hopes far, far too low in other ways. We may have expected too much for ourselves and from ourselves, uh, and we may have not, or no, we have not expected enough from God. Uh, we have expected too much from ourselves because we usually do not really see ourselves as we really are. This confession of chapter 64 is our confession. You were angry for we sinned, and we continued in them a long time. Whenever we uh, run up against the idea of ourselves as sinners, whenever we run up against a verse like Isaiah 64, 6, all of us have become like one who is unclean, and all our righteous deeds are like a filthy garment. We immediately become like the people in Jesus' parable who are uh, looking for specks in other people's eyes. We immediately start noticing other people. We immediately start ranking ourselves based on uh, pe- other people that we know or have heard of that are worse than we are. And you can always find someone who is worse than you. But that's not really the point. The point is you're not comparing yourself to, to other people. You're comparing yourself to a holy God. And compared to him, all our righteous deeds are like a filthy garment. We are not worthy of what God has offered to us because 
we've continued in our sin for a long time. And we set our hopes for ourselves perhaps too high in that we don't really see ourselves as we really are. Um, and yet, we have not expected enough of God because we have not seen Him as He really is. Our hopes for Him and our hopes for what He will do with us and in us are too small. The biblical way of hope is not to uh, just be relentlessly optimistic. The biblical way of hope, I think, is reflected here is to acknowledge when our hopes are broken, to acknowledge when we have something in our life to grieve, and then to take that grief, to take that brokenness, to take those dashed hopes and the pieces of them and put them in the hands of God because we can trust God to care and we can trust God to answer. And we find that when we put our broken hopes in God's hands, that God gives us back, first of all, a new perspective on what God wants to do in our lives. Our hopes are usually about our own comfort. Really. Our, usually. Our, what we hope for, what our dreams are, is usually about our own comfort. Either physically or emotionally, uh, or just a general sense of safety and security. And you can see that reflected even from this prophet, uh, reflected in this passage. What is, what is, if you were to narrow down specifically what it is the prophet is hoping for, it's about verses 10 and 11. The holy cities have become a wilderness, Zion a wilderness, Jerusalem a desolation, our holy and beautiful house has been burned by fire. It's about the precious things that he says in verse 11. All our precious things are become a ruin. What does the prophet hope? What would be a sign that God uh, cares about his people and wants to restore them is that the things around them would be restored. Uh, those symbols of prosperity and those symbols of, of God's presence with them would be rebuilt and would be uh, restored back the way they were. Rebuild Zion. Build back Jerusalem. Build back the temple. Return our precious things. They're ruined. They've become a ruin and bring them back. So that asks the question for us, what are our precious things? What are those things, even the symbols that we depend on for security to tell us that we are prosperous, to tell us that everything is okay and everything is going to be okay? What is it in our life are those precious things and what are our hopes for them? It's usually about our comfort and it's usually about protection, the preservation and prosperity. This is the first Sunday of the season of Advent, and Advent means coming. And I love these hymns and these songs that we've sung today that remind us of the first coming of Christ into the world, but also remind us to look forward. Uh, one of the earliest prayers of Christians, so early that it's still recorded in the Bible in Aramaic, Maranatha, come Lord Jesus. It's this reminder that he is coming again. What do our hopes look like when we hope for God to show up in our lives? We ask if we really mean what we have sung, open up the heavens, we want to see you. What do we hope will happen when we see God? What do we hope will happen then at the end? What do we hope will happen in the meantime as we wait and as we anticipate? I think most of the time our hopes for God are too small because we get stuck on the things around us and don't realize that even if our fondest wishes for our precious things came true, that it wouldn't repair what's really needed in our lives. For example, if uh, just at the surface level, if what the prophet is asking for, or hoping for, came true, rebuilding Zion, rebuilding Jerusalem, and rebuilding the temple, if God showed up and in an instant did all those things, it wouldn't repair the uncleanness and the iniquity and the sin of God's people. The, the things that they looked at with their eyes and saw with their eyes that were broken, uh, if all of those things had been fixed in an instant, it would have done nothing for what is said between verses 5 and 6 and 7. Uh, all of the outward signs of prosperity and protection and safety would be there, but the people of Israel would still need salvation from their sin. They would still need God to repair that broken relationship. I think our hopes for ourselves... I think our hopes for God are too small because what we hope for for our precious things usually won't fix the things that really need to be fixed in us. Preserving and protecting what we treasure won't save us from our sin. 
Uh, it may make the things around us new. You probably, you like me, probably have a long list of things that you would like that are new. <laughs> you probably have things that you've been hanging on to and you haven't gotten rid of yet because they work okay. Uh, they're not great, perhaps, but they, they're, it's not broken yet. They're not broken enough yet. And so, or you just don't have enough <laughs> to, to get all the new things that you would want. But even if we got all the new things that we would want, it wouldn't make us new. Even if we got all the new things that we would want to protect us and preserve us and make us prosperous, it wouldn't make the world new. The world would still be the world. And I think that our hopes for ourselves take so many hits so often because we don't reckon with how fallen our world is. Because we don't reckon with the power of sin in us and in our relationships and uh, all over the world. But we also have not reckoned with how much God wants to do. Our hopes for God are too small. Isaiah prays, open up the heavens, rend the heavens and come down, shake the mountains, set things on fire. And yet, at Advent, at Christmas, when God came, he sent his son. Uh, he, he, as Paul says, did not regard equality with God a thing to be grasped, but humbled himself and took on the form of a servant. When God showed up, he sent his son into a family. When God showed up to save the world, uh, he comes in that way. When he actually does save the world, he does it by dying an unjust death on a cross. You've got to be careful when you ask God to do things you do not expect. When you did awesome things which we did not expect. Uh, God has shaken the mountains in the past. God has set things on fire in the past, but God acts differently. He does something new and unexpected when the Messiah comes. He does something new and unexpected when the Messiah offers himself to save the world. And then he does something unexpected, uh, even more unexpected. He rises from the grave. What is true about what the prophet knows and believes about God because of what God has done in the past is still true. When you're dealing with a God who can tear open the heavens and shake the mountains, then there is no such thing as a hopeless situation because you're dealing with a God that does the unexpected. When you're dealing with a God who comes in the form of a servant, when you're dealing with a God who is Emmanuel, who is God with us, when you're dealing with a God who has walked and worked and loved and died and risen again as one of us, then there is no such thing as a hopeless situation. My prayer is the prayer of Isaiah 64, 1. God, that you would tear open the heavens, but not so that you can repair all the physical things around us that won't fix what really needs to be fixed in us. We know the answer to the question of verse 5. Shall we be saved? The answer is yes. And we'll be saved in the name of Jesus Christ. Saved not only for the future, but saved, being saved now, being sanctified, being transformed. He is rebuilding and remaking us remaking the ruined things in our lives. Tear open the heavens. Don't just protect and preserve us and make us prosperous, but make us new. Make us new people, Christ-like people. Make us more like Christ. Don't just make our little comfortable world around us safe and secure, but make this world new. Make it a place in which the Spirit of God is obviously active. Make it a place in which broken people are restored and made new. Make it a place where the lost are saved. Make it a place where walls of division are torn down and people are made one in the name of Jesus Christ. That's my prayer for Advent, is that God would fire our imagination for how we want him to show up. This has been a tough year in a lot of ways. And I've said before that uh, most of us are, are anxiously anticipating when, when things can get back to normal. But I want to caution you. That God may have more in store for us than that. I know God has more in store for us than that. God's plan for the people of Israel was not just to rebuild Zion and rebuild the temple. God's plan was to send the Messiah and be with them in person. God's plan was to make them new, to repair not just the broken things around them, but to repair them, to make it so that they no longer would have to be called unclean, to make it so that their iniquities would not count against them anymore. They would be made new. And then the world would be made new. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we pray, Lord, 
that you would give us during this season of Advent. Hope. Hope, God, in you showing up in our lives. Lord, we know that you care about the physical needs around us. You care, Lord, about those things that need to be repaired in us. You care, God, about those who are sick, and we pray, Lord, for those who are ill today, those who are in the hospital, those who are at home, uh, who would be with us if they could. And we pray for their healing. But more so, God, we pray that you would make us new, each one of us, God, that your spirit would transform us and make us more Christ-like through whatever circumstances we are in. You are our potter, and we are the clay. And we pray, God, that in difficult circumstances, we pray that in great circumstances, God, that you would be shaping us to make us the people and make us the church that you would have us be. And I pray, Lord, that your spirit would lead us as we think about how you have done great and unexpected things in the past, that you would lead us to hope that you will do new and unexpected things in our future. Thank you for this season, God, for its reminder that you are a God who keeps your promises, for its reminder, God, that uh, there is no hope that we can give to you that is, is beyond your power. You are a God who fulfills every hope. And we pray, Lord, that we would put our hopes in your hands and that you would do with them as you will. We ask it in Jesus' name. Amen.